All right. This is a quick video about Natalie Jermanjenko's feral robotics dogs in the chapter 4.3, Disobedience and Feral Robotic Dogs, Hardware Activism, Communities, and Planned Obsolescence, which is a chapter in this new book that I just got today for the first time. It's my book from available from MIT Press on Amazon and McNally Robinson or whatever booksellers are still in business you can buy them uh, you can buy this book and it's printed in color there's over a hundred uh, around a hundred color photos through the book and it's written in approachable English that uh, is hopefully pleasing and legible to your critical theory comparative literature nerds and cultural theorists, as well as engineers with no real background in science and technology studies, and the general public. I've tried to write this in an approachable, um, approachable English that goes into interesting topics and deep topics and complex topics, but tries to do it in a way that is not just jargon and uh, confusing academic language. I really have a, a short, um, I, I think a lot of scholars who do work like that are uh, really limiting their audiences in an unproductive way that really doesn't benefit their discipline at all. And it's a good way for the humanities to be obsolete, to be honest with you. Anyhow, I, so um, in this chapter, I talk about Disobedience and Feral Robotic Dogs by Natalie Jermanjenko. Um, and a number of these projects really are from the bulk of them are in the 90s. This project is from 2003, where Natalie Jermanjenko and her collaborators had built workshops where they'd taken these uh, toys that were kind of these robotic dogs that were available in by 2003 i actually think these toys started emerging in the mid 90s and by 2003 they were sort of available widely as a uh, surplus and at low cost she'd taken these had built workshops to add things like pollution sensors to them bigger wheels to go over rougher stuff and made them turn and actually sniff out pollution. She'd worked with um, community groups. Um, this was in New York City, in, uh, at the Bronx River. And these machines would be let out into the public, public space, and they would sniff out uh, areas of toxicity and this was really productive in terms of cre actually creating uh, a buzz and a media uh, interest in this topic. It, it was, I, th I think that it's really a clever kind of embodied um, and situated, kind of located in a park and not like in a scientific paper, visualization of data. This, this uh, kind of like a Nancy Patterson stock market skirt, uh, visualizing financial information. This is kind of like a DIY hack approach to visualizing pollution right in the parks and public spaces where it is. And it has an advantage because it looks a lot more interesting as far as I'm concerned than a bar chart. It's about 400 times more interesting, and you get the bonus of involving community folks who, teaching them this stuff. They make this stuff, they let it out, they learn about the technology, plus you get them sort of um, feeling like they have a role in developing technology and can, um, and also their communities. So I think it's a great example. I know people have written about this. Uh, and that's okay. I think more should be written about it, frankly. Uh, a lot of Jermanjenko's work is, is really phenomenal. So 
the way that this was done is that it kind of intentionally used this what I term as trailing edge technology, not not the leading edge, but kind of almost obsolete stuff at low cost, hacking it to build kind of a citizen science kind of platform. Um, and, you know, there are, and I, I refer here to uh, the artwork by Shi Che Huang, um, somebody who takes electronics and repurposes them in interesting ways. I think this is very, you know, you see this creative reuse and almost creative misappropriation uh, like German Jenko or Huang. Um, that is an important part of uh, doing artwork with technology. Um, other people I uh, include, you know, Jonah Burke Cohen and Catherine Marwaki, Ken Gregory, uh, Benjamin Gallant, um, circuit bending. Um, and one way to think about this work as is kind of intervening in the idea of planned obsolescence. Um, planned obsolescence is this idea that was engineered and designed by Bernard London in 1932. Um, as a solution to the Great Depression. Basically, the idea is that products should expire. They shouldn't last forever. They should be disposable. Um, and this has inspired all sorts of stuff from how mobile phones are developed, your printer, your disposable razor blades, and all the rest of it. Planned obsolescence is built in, and we can thank or curse Bernard London for a lot of that. Um, the, other people like Victor Lebeau in 1955 uh, also refined this idea. And I think that artists have a responsibility to sort of uh, intervene in this and to question why stuff should be obsolete. Uh, of course, stuff like this isn't, isn't really new. This is, you know, kind of an environmental uh, angle that a lot of people have taken instead of looking at, you know, just how fast to sell products. Uh, instead, looking at the cradle to grave or cradle to cradle kind of repurposing of what happens to that product after it's not useful. How do you recycle it? And I would say that artists have the ability to recycle stuff and to use the technology in, a, in a very interesting ways. So, uh, German Jenko talks about this as feral, where it's uh, that's the term that she uses to talk about this work where. Um, you know, using this idea of feral technology, a uh, feral where it's like a domestic animal that has has been uh, set out into the wild. I think that this approach is is great, and I'd encourage you to actually look at German Jenko's work and all these artists' work. Uh, they have a lot of other projects that aren't just um, here in my book. I'm only talking about one or two of each of their projects. So, anyhow. Um, it's kind of a tactical approach of uh, using, um, you know, kind of a activist, trickster attitude to building technology, and that this is often good at creating kind of open-ended situations and scenes and 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 kind of happenings that play well into the media and play well into videos, documentation, photographs, and this kind of thing. So that's it for the chapter of, no, not Hairbrain 2000, well, that's the previous chapter. Disobedience and feral robotic dogs, hardware activism, communities, and planned obsolescence, featuring the work of Natalie Jamanjenko in Art and DIY Electronics by me from MIT Press, available everywhere today. Thanks.